Uh, my name is Tim Kawahara, and I am the executive director of the Zyman Center. Today's webinar is titled, Place to be non-traditional services for well-being among unhoused Angelinos. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank our numerous partners uh, for this program. Today's webinar is a joint presentation brought to you by City Lab UCLA and the UCLA Zyman Center's Housing as Healthcare Initiative and Levine Program uh, in Housing and Social Responsibility, um, in partnership with UCLA Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Equity, uh, Department of Health Policy and Management, UCLA Fielding School. Uh, Public Health, uh, and UCLA Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center. Uh, so clearly it takes a village to put these on. Uh, we have organized an informative and expert slate of speakers uh, to present today, and they include uh, Dr. Burton Cowgill. He is Associate Professor, UCLA Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Equity, Department of Health Policy and Management, UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Uh, Danielle Palazzo, Research Associate, City Lab LA, uh, she is a MERP and PhD from the UCLA Luskin School um, and UCLA Fielding concurrent student. Um, and then, of course, our dear friend uh, and longtime Zyman Center collaborator, uh, Professor Dana, Dana Cuff. Uh, Dana is the director of City Lab LA and professor architecture, uh, urban design uh, here at UCLA. And then finally, we have Dr. Wendelin Slusser, associate vice provost, UCLA Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center and clinical professor, UCLA Schools of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, just one health uh, housekeeping item. Uh, we will have time for uh, questions and answers at the end, so please submit any questions that you have via uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, I would now like to turn the program over to our first speaker, uh, Bert Cowgill. Bert. All right, well, thank you very much, Tim, for the great introduction. As we pull up our slides here, um, it's my pleasure to kind of give you all some background on the project and the team that brought us together. So this is um, here, the slides are coming up. So this is titled, as Tim said, Place to be Non-Traditional um, Services for Well-Being Among Unhoused Angelinos. And if you could go on to the next slide, in addition to those of us that are here today, I'd also like to recognize some really key contributors to this work. Um, Alejandra and Rain, both from City Lab, were major contributors, both to the conduct of the study as well as the writing of this report. And we'd also like to thank Naomi, Jane, and Konami for their contributions as well. Um, we'd like to acknowledge um, funding support from the Zeman Center, as well as from a UCLA transdition, Transdisciplinary Research Acceleration Grant. And then our community partner with this effort is the Venice Family Clinic. And we would especially like to thank their um, providers and support staff for their contributions throughout our project. All right, go on to the next slide, please. So we're here today to really talk about the intersection of health and well-being and the unhoused population. So you see right here, starting off statistic that for un the unhoused population, life expectancy <clears throat> is about 63 years. So this is 14 years less than the average life expectancy in the US. And we're using life expectancy here really as a single indicator that represents the complexities of health and well being for those that are living without shelter. As we can see, over 500, almost 600,000 individuals are unhoused in the United States. Um, this includes 20% of those living in US households facing some form of housing insecurity. Renters are almost twice as likely to face housing insecurity and Black and Latinx renters are much more likely to be housing insecure, representing many of the inequities um, that exaggerate the race, through racial injustices around the issues of housing and health. Um, so here we're presenting some national numbers, but we wanna point out that Los Angeles County is home to the greatest number of unhoused individuals as well. So our work today really focuses on Los Angeles. Okay, next slide. So through this effort, which I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides, um, we set off with a number of research questions, many of which really have not been explored amongst this population. Um, we've, we first set out to look at the literature and to see what instruments are currently being used to measure well-being amongst the unhoused population. We went further then and talked to many individuals who are receiving services through the Venice Family Clinic about what, about what well-being means to them. 
Um, we wanted to learn more about the linkage between physical spaces of homelessness, where services are being provided, and how that interconnects with well-being. We next went on um, to look at how healthcare is being delivered to unhoused populations outside of Los Angeles, as well as within Los Angeles, that doesn't include your traditional brick and mortar types of clinics. And then lastly, we asked our participants what types of alternative spaces might enhance community health services for unhoused clients and their service providers. So we hope to explore all of these questions with you today. Next slide, please. All right, but before diving in, um, we really want to acknowledge some of the unique aspects of engaging in this type of work and how the um, concept of trust was really central to the success of this project. You know, both the trust that we as researchers had with the Venice Family Clinic and their, their um, staff and the work that they were doing in the field and their support of us interacting with their clients and, and gaining valuable insights from them through our conversations. Um, we also really want to acknowledge the trust that the Venice Family Clinic staff and providers have developed with the unhoused population, really um, speaking to the success that they've experienced with providing services, and really just going and acknowledging the dedication and commitment um, that these individuals have brought to their work. Um, we're going to hear a number of quotes from individuals that we talked with today, but here I wanted to start us off with a quote from one of the um, Venice Family Clinic providers that kind of gives you the, the framework for what we're dealing with here. Um, goes on to say, it's just getting to know people. Sometimes it's follow-up care where the clinician will continue to engage with them and follow up with, with whatever needs to have. It's not like a traditional doctor's visit when you're like straight down to business. You're talking about your day, the drama that happened the night before. And sometimes it is some heavy case management that a cl clinician would have to kind of involve themselves with. So we're, we're seeing here right from the get-go that this is not a traditional provision of healthcare services or services focusing on, focusing on well-being, but involves a much broader set of circumstances that the providers need to consider um, when working with this population, especially in the field. Okay, next slide, please. So um, our, our project consisted of, of five components and we'll share different versions of our different results from each of these with you today. Um, first, we spent a little bit of time going into the literature and looked at the establishment of well-being indices or tools that are out there that can, that can assess individuals health and well-being status. Um, and we especially were interested if any scales have been developed to work um, with the unhoused population and what types of well-being scales were being used amongst those studies that engage the unhoused population. Um, then we went on and we engaged in a number of case studies with different clinics and looked at different formats in which healthcare services were being provided to unhoused individuals. And then we focused on our main community partner, which is the Venice Family Clinic and the mobile services that they provide on the west side of Los Angeles. Um, we did a number of interviews with clients, and you will hear more about them from Danielle, um, as well as we interviewed the service providers and support staff at the Venice Family Clinic. And then lastly, Dana will be talking about a design workshop that we hosted with many of the service providers to really think about how we can integrate um, spaces and places with the unhoused population and the, and the provision of services around well-being. Next slide, please. So for some of you, well-being may be a concept that you're not 100% familiar with. So I wanted to take a moment here and step back and provide a definition um, from the World Health Organization. From This comes from 2021, so pretty recent. Um, and the World Health Organization defines well-being as a positive state and, quote, as a resource for daily life determined by social, economic, and environmental conditions. Well-being encompasses quality of life and the ability of people in societies to contribute to the world with a sense of meaning and purpose. Right. So our first, you know, assessment of this definition should tell us it's multi-dimensional multi and doesn't focus on maybe just traditional aspects of physical health and or mental health that may come to mind. Um, when we started to look at some of the tools that are being used amongst studies with the unhoused population, we could see that constructs such as life satisfaction, happiness, and economic stability may be assessed, but when these um, constructs are used in isolation, they really fall short with measuring overall well-being. Next slide, please. 
So why are we so concerned about well-being versus traditional health indices amongst this population? Well, if you look at this pie chart over here on the right, it talks about what really determines the health of a population at an overall population level. You know, many of us may think healthcare services play a major role, but we can see here in the green slice of the pie that really less than a quarter of population health is influenced by direct medical care. Instead, if you look over at the purple side, we see how social circumstances and the environment really play a large role in health and well being. So, this is where things like housing insecurity, food insecurity, poverty, access to healthy food, spaces to exercise, safe, safe places to sleep, et cetera, all are going to impact an individual's health. Um, we also see health behaviors, our ability to eat well, get sleep and exercise also play a major role. So without really looking at well-being in total, we don't have a good um, measure of how an individual is doing outside of our traditional physical and mental health constructs. So in our literature review for scales of well-being, we found that most studies that included unhoused populations rarely used a comprehensive set of items that could really give us a full assessment of well-being. And more importantly, there were no tailored scales of well-being that were developed for those experiencing housing insecurity. Just to give a flavor, some of the domains that we saw in our assessment of scales of well-being did include traditional measures of health status as well as emotional health, subjective quality of life, life satisfaction, living conditions, the housing situation, financial situation, social support, education, income, health insurance status, and basic demographic information. But again, we really did not see a scale that brought together all of these constructs in a way that would give us a full picture of well-being. The next slide, please. So before I pass it off to Danielle to talk about some of the experiences that our, um, the clients experienced and their definitions around well-being, we asked the providers at the Venice Family Clinic their thoughts about developing a scale of well-being that could assess those that were unhoused. Now, this type of scale will be important as we develop interventions and to assess the impact that they're having on the unhoused population. We saw two different really um, trains of thought on this though. One. Um, provider really advocated for using existing scales of well-being, commenting that um, and feeling strongly that standard metrics of well-being should be used regardless of the population, stating that I think it is important that we use the same set of factors so we can compare between the two, unhoused and housed individuals, and that we can really show that drastic difference. While well, another provider believed it was critical to frame well-being in a way that would resonate with people experiencing homelessness, stating, I think definitely asking and not assuming that we have the same set of ideas of what this well-being means is imperative. So as we move forward and we think about the appropriate metrics to use to assess improvements in well-being amongst this population, um, we will do further work to think about adapting existing scales and developing scales that are specific to the unhoused population. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle, who's going to share some insights from the clients that we interviewed about their beliefs around well-being. Thanks for that handoff, Dr. Cowgill. Um, so after reviewing the literature, we wanted to hear from people with lived experience with homelessness to inform how their understandings of well-being aligned with how well-being was being discussed by academics and providers. In the interviews, we also explored how service spaces like Venice Family Clinic's mobile units and Safe Place for Youth impact the well-being of their clients. The interviewees' definitions of well-being coalesced around six domains that generally aligned pretty well with some of the domains that Bert mentioned earlier um, from the literature. However, the interviews did provide some important nuance to how well-being is experienced by people experiencing homelessness. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the domains that we identified in the report, but did want to highlight some key points. So we can go to the next slide. So similarly to our literature review, well-being was understood by participants as multidimensional and expansive. Um, as this participant on the screen put it, well-being is really how they were feeling in all aspects of their lives. Go to the next slide. 
Um, this expansive definition of well-being does mean needing to deal with um, some domains that can be a bit nebulous. Domains like physical health were discussed by our participants, but so were more subjective concepts like life satisfaction. As this participant shared, well-being really includes things that feel good for your soul um, rather than something more concrete like your physical health. Um, focusing on well-being as a goal in service provision requires grappling with needs and concepts that are a little harder to quantify objectively um, than things that we typically measure in determining the, ses the success of a program, um, such as how much food is giving out or um, providing for basic needs items. We can go to the next slide. Another challenge in understanding well being for people experiencing homelessness is that our participants really emphasize the interconnectedness of the components of well being. Um, so it can be difficult at times to separate these intertwined components of well-being into distinct concepts. In this example, a participant explained how intertwined her mental health was with her physical health as she experienced cycles of depression and physical illness. We could go to the next slide. A lot of this emphasis on the interconnectedness of well-being domains seem to really stem directly from the experience of being unhoused, um, which highlights one way that experiences and understandings of well-being may differ between housed and unhoused folks. Um, being able to meet their basic needs, including the need for shelter, uh, was an important domain and one that affected every other domain of well-being in some way for our participants. Um, in this example, uh, one person drew connections between the experience of rough sleeping and their physical health. The same client talked about how being unhoused made her physical health so much more important to her because when she, when she gets sick on the streets, the consequences are so much higher um, than when she has housing. At other times, clients connected their lack of housing with poor social health as they experienced stigma from their housed neighbors around them. Um, this would then connect to consequences to their mental health, and really this list can go on and on, um, explaining how this lack of housing affects all other domains of well-being. Um, it's also important to note that even when the conversations were shifted to discussing how non-housing-based non uh, service spaces, such as the mobile clinics, affect their well-being, uh, participants invariably brought the conversation back to their need for housing or housing support in some way. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we hear from people experiencing homelessness about well -being, what well-being means for them, um, it helps to inform what needs they hope to be met by um, their services. So if the goal for service providers is to increase well-being for unhoused folks um, based on their personal definitions of well-being, it's imperative to engage with the importance of the housing first approach even if the primary service isn't directly to uh, provide housing. This was something that our partners at the Venice Family Clinic um, street medicine teams really deeply understood and tried to address using multidisciplinary outreach teams. Additionally, while this has been done for a long time, these interviews further emphasize the importance of providing multiple services and addressing uh, many needs within the same service space if we want to really maximize uh, impacts on well-being. And this conceptualization of well-being for unhoused folks also really informs some spatial considerations for these service spaces. Um, and my colleague Dana is going to go a little further into that. So I'll hand it off to Dana. Thanks, Danielle. So you can see in the um, organization of the study, we began by thinking about unconventional spatial responses to unhoused uh, residents of Los Angeles's health and well-being needs. But since we couldn't define well-being so effectively among an unhoused population, we stepped back to try to determine that uh, aspect of our study. And 
we had this notion at the start, which really stemmed uh, inter in spatial terms from the work we had done at City Lab around the Bruin Hub, which you're seeing on the screen here, a site that serves long distance commuters and housing insecure students, a group that two groups that overlap greatly um, with something that you know, it looks like a kind of giant jelly bean, but it's a transitional shelter such setup for a few hours a day to an overnight setting on campus and really serves as an access point for other basic needs and services that UCLA provides. And we thought these interim kinds of uh, transitional solutions might be ones that would transfer to our colleagues at the Venice Family Clinic, whose street medicine teams were really heroic and whose mobile clinics were doing um, really Herculean work with the unhoused population. Um, the thought was that if we could develop some kind of more robust idea about well-being and unconventional service health service provision, like the mobile clinics, maybe we could improve those and just like the Bruin Hub destigmatized housing insecurity for UCLA students. Uh, they felt um, a very welcome there. It was a home away from home. There were many students who weren't experiencing housing insecurity or weren't long distance commuters who also found the space. Uh, useful and joyful. Maybe there was something similar that we could um, find for Venice Family Clinic, which would be a prototype more broadly for unconventional service provision uh, amongst uh, more traditional healthcare providers. If you look at the next slide, we ended up studying six uh, different types of um, cases in Los Angeles, different kinds of unconventional solutions, a place called the um, a, a service hub called the Refresh Spot that's in Skid Row, uh, mobile clinics, different kinds of um, unhoused population service centers. And those divided into six different, those six cases divided into four different types of facilities. I referred to one already, which is maybe how we think about the Bruin Hub as an access point or gateway to services. There are also resilience hubs, which provides support at various times of need. Um, the cooling stations that are set up around Skid Row are an example of that. A commons, which is a community bottom-up driven center where People who were unhoused actually um, establish the services and help uh, support the entire center and as a form of empowerment as well as service provision. Um, and then a magnet, which is a multi-service kind of uh, point of service provision that is organized by the provider. So what you see here are the uh, focus that we ended up with at the Venice Family Clinic with its safe place for youth program overlapping as a kind of magnet center, that's a pretty robust form of service provision that includes both a mobile unit and a bricks and mortar unit. And this mobile bricks and mortar uh, question is what Danielle and Bert have both referred to. So besides the conversations that we had with unhoused uh, folks, we worked with service providers who are incredibly uh, under capacity, um, very little time, always on the job. Uh, maybe some of you in the audience are uh, service providers and so understand this. So catching these people with a moment of reflection turned out to be a big methodological issue. We took a kind of workshop format for that and asked them to give us ideas about what kind of spaces they wanted for serving their clientele who was living unsheltered. And you can see in the upper diagram on the upper left that there's a kind of interesting controversy where all those dots, each person, each service provider put a dot on these sliders to say what qualities of space they wanted. There's a kind of contradiction between privacy and visibility in a mobile health unit. The people who are being served need to be able to see 
the mobile van coming to uh, bring medical and well-being services, but they also need high degrees of privacy once services are being provided. And the same turned out to be true with a kind of efficiency and comfortable slider where um, both those qualities were needed. Uh, in contrast to say, uh, what they definitely wanted was a casual walk-in like uh, quality to the mobile health clinic, not a structured or scheduled space. When you get to the bricks and mortar, this, this kinds of preferences change again, as you see in that diagram, thanks for putting the cursor there. Um, and uh, we also asked um, in a second workshop um, for the service providers to give us ideas about which kinds of services, equipment, and service providers were needed. And you see that in the post-it notes on the right. And that's the data that we put together trying to think through what uh, next generation of unconventional or non-traditional service provision might look like um, and how it would function for people living uh, unsheltered. Next slide. Here you see all of the different kinds of services that are needed in spaces of well being for unsheltered clients. This doesn't ca capture the quality questions that I spoke about earlier, but here you see some of the case studies that we had. Um, the access point where uh, people come to this mobile van for services and it can connect to further um, uh, bricks and mortar kinds of settings, uh, but it primarily serves as a single point of access for a rather limited range, an important range, but a limited range of services versus the refresh spot that I referred to earlier in Skid Row, which is um, a commons, meaning that it's a kind of place, a home away from home for the people who are living in that uh, area, unhoused, around Skid Row to get services from food to laundry. This does not yet have a specific health provision, though uh, it, from our analysis is a kind of site where a mobile unit might well be linked with the commons um, services and amenities that are there already. So I think this is my last slide. One of the things the next one. Yeah, one of the things that we discovered from looking at uh, Venice Family Clinic and the Safe Place for Youth was that really it was the most robust of all of our case studies. And even still, the service providers saw so much more that was needed. Um, you can see that in the data collection chart on the left. And in a way, it pointed out to us, just like with housing, that really the it's very difficult uh, in this world of service provision and spatial needs, not to want what is really the best gold standard of services, in the first case, that people would be housed, and in the second case, that they would have a bricks and mortar clinic that was full services. So part of the question is how you bring people to the bricks and mortar, and I think that Venice Family Clinic shows that the mobile units are very valuable in that, but they definitely, as service providers, don't want those kinds of unconventional service provision units, a mobile van, standing alone. It has to be combined with a bricks and mortar unit. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Wendy Slusser to talk about final conclusions and next steps. Thank you so much, Dana. Really appreciate that teeing up. And I'd like us to return back to our key informant interviews. And one of the interviewees, uh, just to sort of tell you where he is now, is sober, has a job, and lives in a pod share, where he says, and this is an order of preference or what he likes the most about the pod share, his belongings are safe. He meets people traveling from around the world and he has a roof over his head. I thought what was particularly striking was the um, priority of social well-being and also safety of his material goods. Uh, as you can see, this is a example of a pod share and you can 
join PodShares. And then I, as I understand it, the way this um, interviewee explained to me, you can um, use your membership all the way up and down the coast where there are other PodShares um, that are part of a business model. Uh, next slide, please. So how can we apply what we've learned from the study to UC, given that we know and what Dana alluded to also is that we have our own uh, housing issues and also food insecurity and other essential needs issues. The most recent data shows that at uh, UC-wide, 43% of our undergraduates um, were food insecure in 2022 and graduate students, 35%. Housing insecurity, 8% of undergrads and 5% of graduates in 2023. Next slide, please. So our housing and hospitality team led by um, AVP Pete Angelis and Chief of Staff Sarah Dundish have been addressing student food and housing insecurity for decades. And the most recent housing development benefited from starting the process by finding out what, can, what kind of layout and features did the student stakeholders want. Just like we held fo focus groups in this study, they too ran focus groups. And in addition to that, behavior-based kinds of methodologies to utilize student selection and preference data for most popular design features. They uh, leaned into the student leadership uh, to help with the schematic design. Students um, also are going to be revisited in terms of their satisfaction and also just even the process itself. And they added things like ice machines on each floor, placements of stoves and ovens, what tables to support the kitchen. Uh, and by the way, in the focus groups, they found that um, the students were much more interested in not having their own bathroom or their own kitchen uh, because they wanted to be um, able to interact with other students and be less lonely. And they thought that if they had their own apartment, it would um, not be as well good for their social well-being. And lastly, given our density at UCLA, um, it was an advantage to find that that's what the students wanted, um, which was great. So these community space spaces and programming um, allowed us or allowed um, Pete Angelus and his team to actually design a Gailey Tower redevelopment uh, that featured uh, an incredible amount of beds, 545 beds uh, will be planned for this development that will be launched in 2026, uh, 187 bedrooms and 545 beds, and 355, 358 of those beds will be for low-income uh, students. And they are estimating that the cost will be about $800 per month for the students to live in this um, new development. Next slide, so you can see some of the features of this development. So it's co-living, that's what they're calling it, dorm style. And as you can see, the um, building is about, I think it's estimating they're aiming to have eight floors. Uh, the previous building that will be um, removed to replace, be replaced by this only had a hundred beds. Remember this is gonna have 545 beds. So it's gonna be uh, able to address some of our housing insecurity challenges that we have on our campus. Uh, next slide, please. And you'll, you can see there's, um, this is the living area with the uh, triple bed uh, bedrooms, and then you'll have the hallways. Next slide, please. And this is a common living area, which will be the kitchen and you can watch, you know, a Knicks game or if you're a Laker fan, whatever fan you are, uh, and you can study there. Next slide. Uh, so in conclusion, I'd like to just uh, sum up what we've all been talking about uh, as we present this study and then other ways that we can apply what we've learned from the study, but or what we've already been doing, like the Bruin Hub. Our literature review um, uh, basically shows that there needs to be the development and adoption of a well-being metric. The second conclusion is one's basic needs is both fundamental to understand well-being, but it's also people need to um, understand how complicated the effort to define 
distinct components of this to be measured um, among the unhoused. The third is our research reaffirms the housing first approach. The fourth is spatial design choices and service provision, such as privacy is vital when providing care for unhoused communities. And fifth is alternative mobile means of bringing care are important, but they remain a complementary practice to permanent investments, uh, just as Dana concluded um, in her last series of slides. I'd like to um, leave everyone with something hopeful. And if you don't know about this already, it's a quote from the chair and CEO of Kaiser who recognizes housing insecurity and its negative impact on health. And there, uh, I quote, uh, he says, our mission to improve the health of our members and their communities demands that Kaiser Permanente continues to lead, support, and catalyze others to address the public health issue of homelessness and housing insecurity. And he concludes that housing insecurity has a negative impact on health and will require on and all hands on deck to approach solving this problem. So I thank you all for participating in this presentation. As you can see, we're a transdisciplinary team. It's We're taking the challenge of the CEO saying all hands on uh, in terms of trying to grapple with this challenge. And we'll now, I think, be open for questions. I see that we have some interesting questions in the Q&A and maybe I'll just read through some of those. Tim, is that the proper um, schedule? And yeah, okay. that's it. And I have a, I have, I've written down a bunch of questions if you run out. <laughs> Great. Um, well, the first question I think maybe would be one for you to address, Bert. It says, should well being surveys be collected system wide, and I think they mean comprehensively, or should well being measurement be reserved for interventions directly affecting well being, such as mental health services? Great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think our view on this would be ideally you are measuring well being in all situations and circumstances, not knowing necessarily what the needs of, of the individuals or that population may be. You know, what we found with our, you know, assessment in the literature was that, you know, there are some very long and detailed instruments and, and numerous instruments that have been put together to that together can assess well-being um, amongst population. But when you look at some of these constructs, we were questioning, and I think this is where some of the VF Venice Family Clinic providers were also questioning how these would relate to an unhoused population. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I know with some of Danielle's interactions with, with the clients, you know, uh, we, we would ask them, what, what would a good day, a happy day look like for you, <laughs> right? And, you know, depending if you're asking a housed or an unhoused individual, you may expect a different response to that question. So many times we got, it was a good day today because I had a place where I could charge my phone. Okay. Now, if you're talking to a housed individual, my guess is that's probably not going to come up in, in their list of priorities for, for having a good day. So, you know, this is where I think it is important to both assess well-being in all circumstances, um, but also starting to think more critically about some of the constructs and some of the items that we want to use with an unhoused population. So it really can, you know, delve deeper and understand some of the nuances there. Thanks. Uh, and Danielle, this next question uh, might be one that you could answer. Did any respondents who experience homelessness include financial safety and security as specific components of overall well being? I'm curious how common it was or wasn't to hear people talk about needing and wanting paid employment, or whether most were in a position that they might require that might require they be 100% supported financially. Either way, was financial health ever part of mental, physical, emotional well-being? Uh, that's a really great question, so thank you for that. Um, I would say in these specific conversations, financial health wasn't explicitly brought up in terms of like a concrete monetary sense. But it was incorporated in the ability to meet basic needs. Um, so financial health was really central to what our respondents were talking about. Um, but it was more a means to provide for their needs. Um, 
However, it was important for our participants to have some kind of sense of accomplishment. Um, so we did have one participant who talked often about how important it was for her that she had just gotten a job. She was recently um, sheltered and had gotten a job and it was incredibly important to her well-being and, and satisfaction. Um, but it was holistically how that job um, impacted her well-being. So so yes and no, finances were intricately tied um, to well-being, but it was um, more so about meeting basic needs and how finances would help them get there. Thanks. Uh, the next question is kind of in the same vein, and it has to do with uh, the levels of interaction we had with the homeless population. So the question is, was there an advisory committee for this research? And did the committee include people with lived experience of homelessness? I don't know, Wendy, you and I have talked a lot about the trust issue. In fact, our whole team has. Maybe you want to uh, talk about that a little bit. And Sure. Um, great Great question and really um, important to have people with the lived experience help design um, studies and, and also engage individuals. We, um, when we first started this, uh, it's, a, it's a small, you know, in-house paid study. And so what we did was we re reached out to the, our, our partners, Venice Family Clinic being one where I worked for 20 years. So we were able to, um, get our foot in the door there. You know, I think that's one of the areas of trust that you need to have even with providers that are working um, with uh, communities. So we were fortunate and we, so we got a lot of input and advice from the hands-on individuals who were working um, to serve uh, the unhoused population. Uh, we didn't have a specific unhoused individual on a, we didn't have a committee actually, I guess we had an informal form of a committee. Be great thing that we add to our recommendations um, if, if we end up ha doing something bigger. Um, and one thing though, that uh, was really striking that Dana and I found when in our initial conversations with the uh, physician who leads the efforts at Venice Family Clinics that why can't you just give the money for the research and help people get housed? <laughs> I mean, you just said, let's just cut to the chase kind of thing. So um, I got it. I, I get it. And uh, that's why I ended with the quote with Kaiser, because I feel like they're putting their money where their mouth is and they have the money. And I feel that there's opportunity, um, both public and private, because I, as I understand Kaiser's you know, they're a nonprofit, but um, they're partnering with a lot of different entities to make housing possible. It really um, goes to the next question, too, uh, that that has to do with what kinds of spaces in housing are appropriate for formerly homeless individuals. So the question is, often we see government and providers cautious towards shared space and amenities in housing. And I think that's referring, Wendy, to the slides of co-living you showed. And in facilities designed for people exiting homelessness, how can we design successful shared space and amenities in support of housing? Another excellent question. And frankly, we just don't have enough data to know this. We do know from this research, uh, at least from the sort of qualitative responses from unhoused folks, that collective living and the shared space is an important and critical part of well-being from their perspective. We know from the kinds of housing that's being provided, which I think many of the people who are uh, in the audience today also know about that permanent supportive housing comes with services. And that's been one of the keys to making that housing successful over the long run, that people can stay in that housing and not exit back out onto the street. But just what those shared spaces are, I think is something that's especially interesting to me as an architect and urbanist who's thinking about uh, spatial needs of un underserved populations, no one more so than the unhoused population, and what kinds of spaces would make sense. I think that's probably at least another uh, year-long study that the team of us would really be excited to do and help gather the data about that from other research teams. You know, I don't know a related, related question too, Dana, um, right. is that 
you know, there are also different groups, demographics within the homeless population. So, um, you know, spatial needs and design and healthcare delivery systems could be different for, say, seniors versus veterans versus transitional age youth versus battered women versus families versus singles. And so, you know, each one of those, I think each of those need to be taken into cons consideration when you're talking about healthcare delivery and also the physical design of the space. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Tim. I mean, I think we're, we've all become much more aware of the homogenization of unsheltered folks that just the lack of shelter isn't what defines them. You know, there are so many aspects of now families increasingly being out on the street and seniors at the same time. I, I don't think that means that we can't mix populations at all, but it means that the kind of spaces that they need and the services that we provide would be more customized. Maybe somebody else on our team would want to answer that also or talk about that. Well, I'm thinking like, well, if you think the dorm is going to be homogenous, you know, it's going to be homogenous, right? And it's based on a um, series of qualitative uh, research and it's by the housing and hospitality to learn what they want. But I think it would be super interesting and based on the lived experience question too, there's a whole now um, effort to gather um, information from people uh, through non-traditional kinds of qualitative methods like storytelling and poetry and photography. And I could see us when that dorm opens in 2026, potentially capturing those kinds of uh, lived experiences with those students and seeing how they are um, interacting and 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 how it's impacting them. Them now we wouldn't have a comparison, but if that's okay. Qualitative research doesn't need a comparison; it just needs something to see how thing people are are interacting with their new space and see if what was picked up in the beginning really plays out. A couple more questions popped into the Q and A, and Bert, I think this comes back to you. What did this research yield, if anything, in terms of best practices for staffing these spaces and how service staff interact with people utilizing these services? Thanks, Dana, and thank you for the question. And, um, you know, if Wendy and Diane, Danielle, who've done the interviews as well, please jump in here if I've missed anything. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, and kind of leading off with one of my early slides really talked about the dedication and commitment um, that, that the providers at the Venice Family Clinic have, have really put forth in their work in connecting individuals that are unhoused through their mobile services with more, the more brick and mortar, um, you know, establishments, clinics further on down the road. So, you know, I, I, I think some of the best practices we really saw and, and exemplified by that quote I shared as well is that, you know, providers need to have an open mind. They need to meet the clients where they are. You know, to Tim's point here with the different populations that we may be dealing with, you have to really understand the social determinants of health and how they're playing out in this individual's life and then start to connect the services. Um, you know, not only Kaiser, but other health insurers um, in California, our Medi-Cal program through the CalAIM efforts are really looking at that housing is the first step, right? So I think, you know, we, we would argue that our research just amplifies these messages that we've heard before. How can we start to address the well-being, the physical health, mental health, social health needs of an individual without giving them a permanent place to start from where they can be reconnected, where they can be found, where follow-up services um, can be provided. You know, so I think that's, you know, really one of the key takeaways from this work. And then, you know, the second is from the providers that really to have the best outcomes, we, we need to meet the individuals where they are in the community in these non-traditional settings, but try to shift them and maneuver them into more brick and mortar establishments after, the, after they received housing to really benefit most. Um, a number of years ago, I was doing a talk for a lot of CFOs who ran federally qualified health centers. Um, and in doing my research for that talk, I found that you know, United Healthcare and some of our other major health insurance companies were, were really recognizing the benefit of actually paying for housing. Um, you know, making the argument that I can house an individual for a year and that may equate to one emergency department visit. So if I can eliminate emergency department visits for, you know, complex patients through 
housing. Not only this is a best practice in terms of meeting their healthcare needs, but from a financial standpoint, um, this is really, you know, the way to go. So I think, you know, the work that we've started to do here really just connects back um, to many of the key constructs and points we're finding in terms of best practices for this population. There are a couple more questions. Tim, should I take those up or do you want to jump in? No, go ahead, Dana. Okay. Uh, so I don't know, Danielle or Wendy, maybe one of you would be interested in this one. It goes directly to our questions about methodology, which this team has discussed a lot. My experience has been that many of the unhoused are reluctant to engage and share what they are and have experienced. What was the response rate from the unhoused being surveyed? And how confident are you that the surveys are representative of the unhoused? I mean, frankly, we didn't do surveys because that would be an impossibility in the population we were working with. And we didn't feel like it would get to the lived experience questions that we felt were really important. But uh, Danielle or Wendy, do you want to talk about that more specifically? Um. I, I agree with what you just said, um, Dr. Mm -hmm. but these were really in-depth qualitative interviews. Um, so I don't think the aim was to find something that could be necessarily representative, um, but more so uh, really getting that rich depth and flavor of what people are saying um, and the people that we were able to speak with at Venice Family Clinic. Um, so it's giving us a direction of what we should look into further um, and giving us some indication of where unhoused and housed people may be aligning when it comes to well-being. Uh, but it's it needs further study and definitely I wouldn't say is representative, but gives us some really important places to look into. Yeah, I would agree with Danielle. And also to Tim's point, there's so many different populations of unhoused individuals. So uh, this is just a small fraction of 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 the population that are unhoused. So, I could we could just say that we this reflects what we found in a population that is served by Venice Family Clinic. One thing we did, um, it what was kind of I guess proof of at least some consistency was that the the uh, patients that were unhoused and the providers that took care of the patients, they all agreed that it was really important to have a consistent caregiver for them and also reliable. Like they knew they could call and someone call them right back. It wasn't like, you know, how you call sometimes a call center and you never get the call back. I mean, they, they knew exactly who to go to, how to get their resources that they needed in the brick and mortar and also in the, more temporary, you know, uh, the vans that moved around the neighborhood. They knew exactly when that van was going to be there on Monday at evening. So there was a lot of uh, consistency, which I think, um, and and they both sides of the um, resource uh, agreed that that was a critical piece. Great. So the last question is one I'd love to take up. Uh, would love to know what Dana Cuff, as a design professional, thinks of the downtown women's center model of permanent supportive housing. The residents enjoy the privacy of their own studios within a larger community. Do you think that's isolating or empowering? Uh, I actually think that that's a nice way to end both a lot of the comments that have come up, um, that taking a special population, the unhoused women, and providing them both the privacy and the community that we could see on that quality of space slider was directly in the center. You need both privacy and community for well-being. And that's what something like private rooms, uh, as well as having a community uh, space could provide. I haven't seen the community space at the Women's Center, but I can see that their intentions, uh, and I know from studying about them, their intentions are to provide that sweet spot in the middle where people have the privacy and community that they need. So I would imagine that that would be a kind of space you'd want to, we could study to see how successful the balance is that they've established. That's the last question from our Q&A zone. 
I have a couple of questions that perhaps we can end on, Dana. I guess one, uh, one would be um, with regard to these mobile deployments, you know, and I know you mentioned Skid Row and some other places. Those are obvious. Those are the obvious spots because that's where the concentration of homeless people are. Um, but, you know, they, they tend to be in these spots like Skid Row because that's where the services are. So they want to connect with the services. But it very well be the, may be the case that uh, mobile deployment might be needed in places other than Skid Row. You know, you think about spatially, um, there are pockets of homeless that are outside these high service areas and whether there was any consideration of deployment of these mobile units. And then finally, I just was wondering if, if and this may be for the next study, but sort of evaluation metrics of, of all of this and whether it's making a dent and um, you know, uh, leading to better outcomes. Right. Well, in terms of the um, you're right about the concentration of unhoused people in Skid Row, a natural place for this really comprehensive and robust service center called the Refresh Spot. But really, Venice Family Clinic is darting out with their mobile clinic to all kinds of spaces where unhoused people are living on the street. So they're already addressing that. And I think other mobile vans are really mobile specifically because it's hard to get a bricks and mortar established where homeless populations are concentrating. Um, and, you know, that was really the instigation for the study in the first place, was seeing that mobile services that are being provided have been so important to building healthier outcomes for unsheltered people, maybe there was a way of doing that better, making it more reliable or linking it to more um, established service provision. And we did see that in the case of the Venice Family Clinic, where their mobile clinic was tied to their bricks and mortar, it really was the effective recipe that the service providers wanted to see, each being more robust. Of course, they wanted it to be even better. Um, but the question, the second question, I don't know, maybe Bert or Wendy, you would want to deal with that. Sure, I can take that one. Um, so I, I would say I think our our finding when we did our assessment of, of metrics around well being that are that have been used amongst the unhoused population is that, you know, we we need to think about this a bit more. And you know, as as you evaluate, there's two types of comparisons you may want to do. Um, if you're speaking within the unhoused population, you may want to look at improvement. So you need a baseline and you need to know where you're going from there. And I think what we definitely saw was that that those metrics need to be multidimensional. You can't just focus on physical, mental health, but emotional health, social, spiritual, financial well-being. All of those constructs need to be included. So as you understand and connect with an individual and transition them from maybe more um, remote mobile services to brick and mortar services, you hope to see improvements. But the other side, and I did see a you know policy question there, when you are making the case for homeless services, you then need to be able to compare to other housed individuals. So this is where having metrics that can be used both amongst housed and unhoused can serve you in that area. So you know what I would love to explore more is a balance of those two. So how we can both make the case for the population and why resources are needed to address equity, but also then look at our early successes and see that we are moving the needle with our investments in addressing well-being amongst the unhoused population. I also wonder too, and this is not, I don't think it's been studied, but we know that uh, healthcare providers are trusted, usually mes messengers. And I'm wondering if this approach of like Kaiser or other healthcare providers being the ones that are setting up the housing, how that might actually be a more acceptable methodology of delivery than having a city government or something, you know, Definitely another, potentially another nonprofit that's trusted to doing services, not just healthcare providers, but those that are doing the services to this population being the ones that are also sort of spearheading these, these places for shelter. Yeah, I think there was maybe one question that came in we could, that we could end with. I think it's an appropriate question. About the implications for policy. Exactly. Yes, of course. Uh, and Bert referred to this. I think we all feel that uh, policy direction is where we would like to head. Uh, and it, it's going to take, you know, it's classic of academics to say we need more study. So I hate to be, uh, you know, ventriloquizing that. But in fact, we don't have enough data yet. 
having written policy around housing myself, um, to be sure that uh, we know what we're recommending will actually be helpful. But I could definitely see policy related to uh, greater access for mobile clinics, for the need for su financial support for mobile clinics for bricks and mortar uh, well-being sites. And potentially, I mean, the kind of thing that would interest me in particular would be to think through what one of the earlier questions questioners asked how private space and shared collective space together might be built into housing policies, permanent supportive housing policy, so that uh, we get better outcomes. I think one of the reasons that's really important is because of the press for things like tiny homes, you know, which we all see is better than living on the street, but isn't exactly a solution yet. It's really a transitional solution where people get stuck for a long period of time. And so, you know, from the single small rooms that we might see in some of the co-housing solutions, whether that's at UCLA or in the Women's uh, Center, we want to make sure we built in also the shared spaces that will provide a kind of long-term well-being for the people who live there. Yeah, I think there's no question we need, a, uh, in my opinion, a whole mix of housing solutions for homeless populations and that, you know, the ultimate answer is permanent supportive housing. But as we know, that's very expensive, up to seven hundred and plus thousand dollars a unit. I mean, it also takes five, six years to deliver, you know, and we obviously have huge problems now with growing homeless populations. So we did we do need those tiny homes. Those transitional options, I think, are very critical as well, in addition to the permanent supportive housing. But with that, we are out of time. I do want to thank our speakers for I think this was an excellent conversation, hopefully very thought provoking for our audience. Um, the excellent presentations and uh, very uh, interesting conversation as well. So um, thank you, Dana, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, thanks thank for you. joining this afternoon. Um, I hope you will join us for future programs. Um, and please enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.